Hey, Shalom Shalom from your Dutch Uncle John, here to tell you what it is in the book of Job. You know, uh, Job uh, has kind of a unique uh, characteristic of uh, a complete work devoted to this one question, why do good people suffer? This is a most difficult question, and it's a stumbling block for a lot of people uh, having faith in God. So we want to delve into this difficult question, um, and Job kind of helps answer it. Um, so suffering, uh, we can look at it as uh, there is suffering for sure, and there is God. So we have to ask, God, is he all-powerful or not all-powerful? That's the two options. And is God good or is God not good? Well, let's look at all four possibilities. Let's start down here. He's not all-powerful and he's not good, which means God can't stop suffering and he doesn't want to stop it. He's not good. So that is one option. I don't like that option so much. Uh, okay, how about, this one's even worse. He's all-powerful, he can do anything, but he's not good. In that case, God could stop suffering if he wanted to, but he doesn't, because he's not good. That would be a horrible God. Let's get rid of that one. Oh, and if you look at Deuteronomy 32.4, it says, He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. So, God is good. So, we can eliminate those bottom two. Whew. Okay. So, if God is good, let's look at the possibilities. One, he's not all-powerful. So, he's good. He wants to stop suffering, but he's not all-powerful when he can't. Well, we know that can't be true because uh, of Genesis 18, 14. It says, uh, God says, Is anything too difficult for Yahweh? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this same time next year, and Sarah will have a son. In Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Isaiah 14, 27, For the Lord of armies has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? And the New Testament even confirms it in Luke 1.37. For with God, nothing is impossible. So, we know God is all-powerful, omnipotent. So, that second option is not possible. So, it leaves us with that God is good. He wants to stop suffering. And he's all-powerful. And he can stop suffering, but the question is, why doesn't he? And this question, you have an answer to it. I have, we all have answers to this. Uh, this this uh, is called a theodicy. Your theodicy is your reasoning, logical reasoning, as to why there is suffering on the planet. However you want to explain it is your theodicy. Got it? Okay. Uh, because we now, we now know God is good and he is all-powerful or almighty. Almighty, Shaddai, one of his titles, Shaddai. Okay, so let's look at Ezekiel 14, 12 through 14. Uh, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, and I stretch out my hand against it and destroy its bread supply and send famine against it and eliminate from it both human and animal life, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness they could only save themselves, declares the Lord God. So here's another reference to Job that he's obviously a righteous man, Right? And that his righteousness, no matter how righteous he was, he could not save his community or his nation or his people. Uh, he could only save himself. Same with Noah and Daniel. That would be a nice 
that would be a nice list to have your name added to. Noah, Daniel, and Job. God considers them righteous. Wow. Cool. Um, another thing we always hear about Job is the patience of Job. Uh, and do you happen to know in the Bible where that's even mentioned? Surprisingly, it's in the New Testament, in James chapter 5, verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So the patience of Job is not found in the book of Job, it's found in the New Testament. Um, speaking of the book of Job, uh, it is in the Old Testament, uh, in what the Jews call the Tanakh. The Tanakh is the entire Old Testament, but it's broken into three parts. There are the first five books, which are the Torah. Then there's the Nevi'im, which are all the prophets. Nevi is prophet, Nevi'im, prophets. And then there's the Ketuvim, which are the writings. And... Three of these books in the writing, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, are in a little class of its own, their own called the Books of Truth, Sefri Emet. Now, why are they called this? Um, well, if you look at their names, Job, Proverbs, and Psalms, in Hebrew, uh, become Eub, uh, Mishli is Proverbs, and Tehillim is Psalms. Uh, Job begins with an Aleph. Uh, Mishli begins with Mem. Uh, Tehillim begins with Tav. And Aleph, Mem, Tav is the word truth. So these three have their own little category, the books of truth. Okay, uh, when did Job live? Well, this is up for debate, and nobody knows for sure. Some say it was during the Exodus and the time of the spies or in the days of the judges. There are those who believe during the time of Ahasuerus, which is kind of Esther's time, which is very late, the time of Jacob. Some believe that the whole story is just like an allegory, okay, that he never really existed, and it's just uh, a story to teach us about uh, how God deals with suffering. Um, I do not believe that. Um, he's not every man. Remember, we had to read that in high school. He's not every man. Uh, there's a good chance he's not Jewish. Um, that's pretty understandable. Because uh, he's probably been before uh, or during the call of Abraham. That's when I kind of think he is, around Abraham's time or Isaac. Um, and the suffering that he did is just, it's just beyond understanding of man that someone could be plagued with this much stuff, okay? Um, it might be that Job uh, considered himself righteous. Maybe that's it. And it, that all this bad stuff is put on him just to knock him down a peg and, and keep his ego in check. Might be. Um, uh, but again, I don't believe it's uh, metaphorical or allegorical or any of that. I think there was a human Job, is my belief. Um, we, we see by reading the book of Job that he has no knowledge, or at least he doesn't show any in the writing, um, or is not shown in the writing, whoever wrote it. He has no knowledge of Moses or the Exodus or the covenant at Sinai. None of that is ever referenced. Um, but Job does know yud heh vav -He, Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, I think just by Job's age, which we will f show how we got this, uh, he, he was 210 when he died. Um, notice he's not before Noah, right? He's definitely after Noah, the, the flood. Um, and uh, back then, they were all living to eight and nine hundred years. Job doesn't fit into that age range. Um, and then after Moses, the years dropped considerably. Uh, so 
he's not after Moses. He's more likely to be in this, again, as I said, Abraham Isaac uh, period where they live to be 180, 175, things like that. Uh, the book of Job, uh, it begins with a prologue of two chapters. Then Job gives a speech. Then he has three friends show up and they all speak to him uh, three times and he answers them three times. Um, the, on the last uh, round, uh, one of his friends does not speak. Then a complete stranger, fourth guy, shows up, Elihu, and he speaks for six chapters. And then God himself speaks in uh, four chapters. Uh, and then we have an epilogue. The uh, prologue and the epilogue are Hebrew prose. And all the other stuff in the middle is poetry and Hebrew poetry. So don't be looking for uh, iambic pentameter and rhymes. Um, so let's get started in Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Um, okay, he's from the land of Uz. Now, we see this, first of all, back in Genesis 10, whenever it gives the, the genealogy of Noah. He had three sons, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Here we have all their kids listed. And you'll notice that Shem had a son named Aram, and Aram had a son named Uz. So, he's from the land of Uz, where wherever Noah's grandson went, Uz, that's that area, okay? And we will see that that's going to be uh, down in... Uh, like in Saudi Arabia, past the Dead Sea, between the Dead Sea and south of there, okay, um, that would be us, the land of Edom, getting down in that area, okay, and the the name us is spelled uh, Ayin Tzadi, and Ayin can take on the uh sound, and the Tzadi is not a z. It's a tz, like in Tsar. So the actual name of this place is Utz, okay, in the Hebrew. And this word, uh, we see this, if you're from America, one of the big brands we have is uh, Utz Pretzels. Mm -hmm. But that would be the same uh, spelling, Utz. All right. better okay uh, today we've got Lubimi cherry this is my second favorite delish okay um that word Utz by the way it comes from uh, it's which means counsel or advice okay that's from the root there you can see it's and we see that in Isaiah 9, 6. Remember this verse? You see it on the Christmas card. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, comma, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let me read that last part there. Vayikara, and he will call his, and he will be called Shamu, his name, Pele, wonderful, Yoetz, counselor. You can see the Ayin Saudi in there, and then El Gibor, God, God, mighty God. Uh, Abiyad, 
Everlasting Father and uh, Shar Shalom, uh, Shalom, uh, the Prince of Peace. So you see that word counselor in there. By the way, he's not a wonderful counselor. Well, he is a wonderful counselor, but those are two different things. His name will be called Wonderful and Counselor and these other ones. Uh, Lamentations gives us an idea here uh, in 421, says uh, where uh, Utz is. Um, so rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz, yet the cup will pass to you as well. You will get drunk and expose yourself. So it's letting us know that Uz or Utz is down in the Edom area, okay? Because Edom dwells there. Um, so back to the prologue. Uh, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Uh, in Hebrew, it's not Job. There's no J. It's Eov, okay? Um, which is very similar in Arabic, Ayub. I have a good friend in Bangladesh, Ayub. Uh, but that's the Arabic version. Um, here it is in, uh, in the Greek and Eub. And notice in English, which God doesn't hide stuff in the English, but this is a cool little thing. The, the name Job is J-O-B. J is a tall letter. O is a small letter. B is a tall letter. And that kind of parallels Job's life. He's riding high, he sinks down to the lowest, and then he comes back up at the end. Ooh, I hate to give away the end, but he's coming back in the end. Uh, very nice. Now, some people think that this Job guy is the son of Issachar, which would be the great, or would be the grandson of Jacob great-great-grandson of Abraham. Uh, and here's why they think that. Uh, in Genesis 46, 13, it says, And the sons of Issachar were Tola and Puva and Job and Shimron. Well, there you see it. It's a Job. And, uh, so that must, be, that must be him, right? Uh, well, it could be a common name. And if you look in Chronicles, um, well, before we look in Chronicles, notice, this is a big thing. The Job that we're talking about is from Uz, Uz, right? Issachar's son, Job, was not from Uz. He was from Canaan, and he went to Egypt when all the brothers went to Egypt to see Joseph. And they lived in Egypt, and then they multiplied in Egypt, and then they were enslaved in Egypt, and then they all left during uh, the, uh, the Passover there when they, the Exodus, right? So there was no time when Issachar or his kids were ever in Edom. They did go home at one point to bury Jacob, but then they came back. They didn't sidetrack down to Edom, to Uz. So I don't see that these two Jobs are the same. Okay. Also, in 1 Chronicles 7, where they're also giving the genealogies, in 7.1 it says, And the sons of Issachar were Tola and Puha, uh, Yashub and Shimron, four in all. Let's compare Genesis 46.13 with 1 Chronicles 7.1. I have and, and then I have the sons, and then Issachar, Tola, and Pua. We're going to skip the next one for a second and go to the end. And Shimron. They all match up. So these are the same kids. These are the, this is the same Issachar. And then you have uh, four in all tacked on there at the end. So let's look at the ones that we didn't talk about. Uh, uh, in Genesis, it says, and Job. And in Chronicles, it says, no, no and, it just says Yeshub. Okay, well, those names are different. Okay, so 
which was, what is his name? Was his name Yeshub? I don't know where in the book of Job is Job ever referred to as Yeshub. I think Issachar's son Job is Yeshub. It's the same kid. It might be a nickname or something, uh, but he's not our Job, okay? Our Job is not the son of Issachar, in spite of what many say. Um, okay, uh, continue on. Uh, a man in the land of Uz, his name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Notice, it says Job was blameless, not sinless. Nobody is sinless except Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. He's the only one sinless. Got it? No one, no one is perfect. We were all born under Adam's curse, right? We're born with original sin. Uh, but here it says Job was Tom. He was blameless. We see that in Genesis 25, 27. This is Jacob and Esau. And it says, when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter and man of the field. But Jacob was an Ish Tom, an innocent man who stayed at home. Ish man, Tom, is mild, uh, innocent, perfect, plain, upright, undefiled. Uh, it's not sinless, but he was just a good man. Got it? Um, so... There it is. Uh, verse 2. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Um, Note when it said he had 500 yoke of oxen, a yoke is that wooden thing that goes over two oxen, and they're used to plow a field. So if he has 500 yoke of oxen, he has 1,000 oxen, because you put two per yoke. Um, verse 4, And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of fasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Wow. Uh, so for, because he was afraid that his children may have become arrogant and denied God, uh, he regularly offered offerings on their behalf. And these are burnt offerings, Olah. Okay? Uh, of all the temple sacrifices, and there are different kinds, uh, the Olah uh, was specifically uh, used to atone for untoward thoughts. Uh, another thing we learn from here, uh, we know that, as I said, that Job has no knowledge of the Moses or the Exodus or the covenant at Sinai. But he does know Yahweh. But Job, this is another point as to when he, when he lived. Job performs the role of priest and head of household. It says he arose early in the morning and sacrificed ten animals for his ten children. He didn't take ten animals to a priest because the whole priestly structure has not been uh, set up yet. So Job is the head of the household, the father of all this and he's serving as priest, okay? So that's before Moses' time, because in Moses' time, they had priests who did the sacrifices for you. Um, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them. And Yahweh said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered Yahweh and said, from going to and forth on the earth, and from w walking back and forth on it. Okay, uh, so who are these sons of God who came to present themselves? That's a good question. Uh, Genesis 6, 2 uh, talks about the Nephilim, 
And there, they are refer referenced as sons of God. Look in verse 1. Now, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took his wives, whomever they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterward as well, when the sons of God had relations with the daughters of men. So these sons of God uh, are maybe some kind of angels, okay? In Hebrew, it's the Beni uh, Ha-Elohim. Um, Elohim, God, okay? Um, and that phrase, Beni Ha-Elohim, or Bene Ha-Elohim, uh, in John 21, 11, in the Brit Hadashah, New Testament, it said, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Remember at the end, uh, Peter went fishing and they couldn't catch anything and he threw the net over and there was 153 fish. How they knew that number, somebody specifically counted them. But that phrase, uh, B'nai uh, ha Elohim, if you put in the gematria value, adds up to 153. A nice tie-in, I don't know what the tie-in is, but it does add up to that. And Peter is fishing, and remember, Peter became fishers of men. Maybe he's fishing for uh, sons of God, I don't know. Um, and we are introduced here to Satan, uh, Hasatan, the H in front is the, and then Satan, and Hasatan means the accuser, okay? And it said, uh, when God asked, where have you been? He said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Well, that confirms New Testament 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So it shows here in the New Testament, Satan's going back and forth looking for whomever he may devour. You know, Satan has three big jobs. He is the tempter, he's the accuser, and he's the punisher. You know, he's the one who dangles the, the beautiful thing in front of us that, uh, that makes us want to sin, right? He's the tempter. Um, uh, the Yetzer Ra of man's evil inclination. So then when he tempts and we fall for his temptation, then he becomes the accuser, right? He stands up and, and points his finger at us and demands retribution. He broke your law, God. He needs to be punished. And he's the punisher because if we don't seek the perfect, perfect, perfect sacrifice of the perfect, innocent, willing Jesus as our Corbon. If we don't accept that blood sacrifice, Satan will do the punishing. He will, uh, he's the angel of death. We will die and we will go to hell forever. So Satan is a tempter, he's an accuser, and he's a punisher. But you can avoid the punishment if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Okay, back to uh, Job 1.8. Then Yahweh said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. You know what I see here? God started this fight. He's the one who pointed out Job to Satan. Hey, Job, have you looked at my, my, my guy here, Job, my servant Job? You know, it's like there's this chess game going on, and God moves first, and he... Er I move Job two places forward, you know, and then, ah, you know, ay, ay, ay. so a lot of times, uh, 
we think we can blame Satan for things that happen to us, but you also have to realize that God sometimes permits this stuff to happen, okay? Whew! Um, and you know what? Why, why did God draw attention to Job, to Satan? Uh, a lot of the biblical scholars, the rabbis and the learned Jewish, the Jewish sages, say that, or they explain it as that uh, it's kind of like uh, if you're a shepherd and you have a flock of sheep and the wolf is coming and then you will give one sheep to the wolf as kind of a scapegoat so that you can get all the other sheep out uh, to safety. So uh, God doesn't need to do that with Job. I, I don't hold on to this belief. Um, God is all powerful. He doesn't need to send one of us as a scapegoat. Does that make sense? And you know what? It's, it's kind of scary. We're supposed to be Christ-like, each of us, right? And if we are 100% Christ-like, which we're told to be and what we're supposed to be, we can't be, but we're, we're, that's our goal, our striving toward this, I'm always worried that God might say, Hey, Satan, uh, have you noticed, Have you considered my servant Dutch Uncle John? Please, God, don't! <laughs> ah! May your will be done. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens, and I'm happy with what you decide. But, my goodness, uh, it's maybe... Nice to have a few sins in your closet just so uh, God won't ever say that to Satan. Just kidding. Okay, so uh, in our chess match, you know, maybe I'm in there and maybe you are in there as one of the, the pieces. You know, in the story that we're going to read here, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, so it's, it's going to either be just preposterous of what happens, or it's true. And I'm going with the second one. It's true. Okay, uh, Job 1 9. So Satan answered Yahweh and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Notice that Satan asks God to do the dirty work. Satan says, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He wants God to do the, the dirty work, and God takes the blame. God doesn't fall for this trick. Verse 12, and Yahweh said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh. So here we do see uh, the accusation. Okay, Does Job fear God for nothing? Um, and, as we showed, Satan wants us to believe that bad things come from God. But as we see... God dodged that bullet. Um, and does Job fear God for nothing? Does anybody fear God for nothing? Or are we all just trying to save our own uh, skins? You know, I think uh, one of the best examples is in 2.16 of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not in need of an answer to give you concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods, nor worship your golden statue that you have set up. There. That is beautiful. All right. Um, also notice in this that God doesn't tell Satan what he can do to Job. 
he does tell Satan what he can't do to Job, right? Just don't lay a finger on his body, on his self, all right? All right, Job 1.13, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. I don't know why it points out oldest brother's house. I just don't know, but it does. Got to be something there. Verse 14, and a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. <laughs> Notice, here Satan's doing it again. I don't know if Satan is inspiring his servant to say this, but it's the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed up all the sheep and servants. See, blaming it on the fire of God, that God did this, which we know he didn't. It's Satan's attempt to blame God. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's not true. And I want to point out, as we get, go through the whole book of Job, you know, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's true. When Job's friends come, they're going to tell Job a lot of things that aren't true. But they sound believable. And here, this sounds beautiful. How often we go someplace, ah, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. No, but here, the Lord did not take away. Satan took away. Job doesn't know that. But the Lord does not take away. John 10.10 10 in the New Testament, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that you would have life and have it abundantly. You see the difference? Poor Job, he's unaware of what's really causing all this. All right, Job chapter 2. Uh, this is also in prose, not the poetry part. Um, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And Yahweh said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then Yahweh said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Remember, Job is blameless, not sinless. Okay. Uh, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And Yahweh said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Okay, so now God has given Satan permission to touch Job. He just can't kill him, okay? And I think it interesting that uh, Satan needed special permission to do this next step. 
God allowed Satan to take his possessions, his children, his animals, his wealth. That was round one, but you can't touch him. Satan had to come back and get extra permission to touch him. That's kind of cool, okay? So your illness and your, uh, that you have, that's, an, that's over and above what God gave permission for um, originally. All right. Uh, two seven. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Uh, then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Notice Mrs. Job, remember she lost her wealth, all her children. She's kind of lost her husband, right? And uh, curse God and die. Come on, Job. Uh, I mean, she's going through a lot also, you know. She's got a lot of pressure on her here. Uh, verse 10, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. That is beautiful. Very nice. Okay. Do we accept only good from God and not adversity? Wow. Um, so, uh, and God and Job did not sin with his lips. He may have sinned with his heart. We don't know that, but not with his lips. Okay. Uh, 211 of Job. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar, they did not recognize him. They lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. You know, it's kind of cool. I, these guys came from afar. I don't know how they communicated that, hey, our friend Job's in trouble, let's all meet. But they did. Um... And notice they sat with him seven days and seven nights, and they didn't speak a word. You ever go to a funeral, and, you know, it's, what do you say? Uh, uh, my deepest condolences. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, the rabbis learn important laws of conduct from Job's friends. When you come to comfort someone who's mourning, you don't need to say anything. Just you being there is a nice, is the nice thing. Let them speak first. Very, very nice rule to learn. Um, by the way, this, uh, uh, you come and mourn for seven days. In Hebrew, uh, that's a, a, a thing that they do. It's called sitting shivas. Uh, where you sit and mourn for seven days someone who has passed. Okay. Um, and, you know, I would think, uh, they say that the death of a child is the worst thing that can ever happen. But that wasn't the worst thing that happened, or it wasn't in the right order. It was, he lost his children first, and then he got an illness. You know, most parents would oh, I'd rather have an illness than... My, my children, something happening to them. Um, and it, these boils were so bad. You know, one time when I was a kid, I had chicken pox. And I went out and picked blackberries and got poison ivy on top of it. Ah! I'm telling you, you know, I understand taking a pot shirt and just scraping, you know, or running a hot shower. And when you can't stand the heat anymore, it feels so good. And then you... Put it hotter. Ah, oh, I get it. Okay, 
So, Job, this is pretty bad stuff. He lost everything. Now he's covered in boils, uh, sitting in uh, ashes, wearing sackcloth. And uh, how do you explain this uh, without... How do you explain this without knowing this dialogue that went on between God and Satan? You know, um, is it God's way of prompting Job to repent on something? You know, that's what normally you would think. Um, or is, is it a warning of, hey, be careful, this is, it could get worse. I don't know how it could get worse with Job here, you know. Or maybe it's a punishment for something he's done. That's what the three friends are going to spend chapters telling him. You must have sinned somewhere, Job. You must have sinned somewhere, Job. Job, I didn't sin. Okay. So, but Job accepts the misfortune without rebelling against God. He does not curse God to his face. In fact, he says, should we accept only good from God and not accept adversity or evil okay uh, let's move on oh by the way we know that uh, yeah I want to I throw this in it's in um, uh, Ecclesiastes 7 because we talked about when you go to a funeral what do you say oh I'm so sorry oh my condolences oh you know what I don't have it in front of me but uh, Ecclesiastes 7.1 says uh, that it's, it's the day of your death is better than the day you were born. Wow! So we should be going to a funeral and saying, congratulations, he made it. Oh, you know, and by the way, that's Ecclesiastes 7.1 verse applies to someone who has that perfect blood sacrifice covering their sins. Because when they die, they've gone up to heaven, right? That's, congratulations, he made it. He's moved on. You know, we don't look at it. We all celebrate births and we mourn funerals. It should be the other way around. Oh my goodness, that poor baby is born into this crazy, nutty, sinful world. What a terrible shame. <laughs> we kind of got it backwards. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, and you know, it's not surprising that these bad things happen to good and good things happen to bad people. In Matthew 5.45, uh, uh, it says that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So, good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. We all, we all get rain, we all get sun. Okay? Okay, so now, we finish chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 3 is going to make an abrupt change. Uh, is there uh, kind of like the whole tone of the, of the book changes? Uh, Job's going to begin these poetic speeches, uh, lamenting his uh, the day of his birth, and we're going to cover that in the next part of Job. Uh, we're going to end it here. Um, what a what a cool story we've had so far! I love it. Okay, all right. Um, and I will tell you, the suffering is not the result of sin, at least in this story. Okay. All right. To God be the honor. To God be the glory. To God be the praise. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Wait. We have a bonus. Okay, um, years ago, and it's probably 25 years ago, I told you this before, uh, I thought I would rewrite the Bible in poetry. And we've read a couple of them here. I think we read something from Esther. I read the Gospels. Uh, I've written those in uh, Higgledy Piggledies. Uh, we've read some stuff from Exodus, which was written in Limericks. Um, the book of Job I wrote in Shakespearean sonnets. Um, and to just give you a brush up from uh, 
English literature class that you had in school. Uh, reminder here, a Shakespearean sonnet has 14 lines of iambic pentameter. Say what? Okay, uh, iambic pentameter is the meter at which the verse flows. And it has the, the form, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. So it has to have that beat to it, okay? It actually is da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum You know what? It's, it's a heartbeat, okay? This is why maybe so many people enjoy iambic pentameter. It kind of mimics, parallels life, your heart, okay? Um, I am in this iambic pentameter. A pent is five, so there's five of these. The dum, the dum, the dum, the dum, the dum, in each line. Um, is this was first introduced uh, by Geoffrey Chaucer uh, back in the 14th century? Shakespeare used iambic pentameter in all his plays and sonnets. Um, John Milton used iambic pentameter in Paradise Lost. Uh, we see, here's a quick example, you've heard, I'm sure, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Romeo's soliloquy. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. So you hear that theme, that, that beat going through. Okay, so we are going to apply those rules uh, to the book of Job. And uh, you also have to have a rhyme scheme. Okay, so the rhyme pattern, because there's 14 lines, it's going to be A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So you can see in the first, uh, the first stanza we wrote, uh, there's 14 lines in the whole thing here. Um, it says, a man named Job lived in the land of Uz, feared God and was deemed blameless in his sight. With camels, oxen, sheep, and mules, Job was, of all the people in the east, the height. So you can see the rhyme scheme here, us, sight, was, height. So there's A, B, A, B. Then you'll see C, D, C, D, the whole way through, E, F, E, F, G, G. Okay, so we've read the first uh, stanza. Let's read on. Of his ten children, daughters numbered three, while seven sons each took turns hosting feasts, to purify each of Job's children he, would after each feast sacrifice ten beasts. One day the angels came before the Lord with Satan who was asked, Where have you been? He answered, All around the earth I've toured. God asked, Have you seen Job who's without sin? Said Satan, Yes, but if his life were worse, I guarantee you to your face he'd curse. The Lord said, very well, he's in your hands, but on the man himself no finger lay. Soon Job received bad news from foreign lands. A raiding party stole his herds away. As he was hearing this news, he got word. God's fire burned his servants and his sheep. He then heard that a camel theft occurred. Job's servants were now in eternal sleep. Another messenger arrived and said, While at a feast your sons and daughters, Job, were struck with a great wind and now are dead. At this Job shaved his head and tore his robe. Said Job, May God be praised, since from the womb I was a naked will be in my tomb. Again the angels came, Satan in tow, and as before the Lord asked him the same, Said Satan, roaming the earth to and fro, God asked, have you seen Job, who's without blame? For life a man will give all that he owns, said Satan, adding, if it were the case, that your hand were to strike his flesh and bones, 
I guarantee he'd surely curse your face. So to Job, Satan sent sore his soul to crown. After God said he's yours, just spare his life. Job scraped himself and in ash heap sat down. Go on, curse God and die, advised Job's wife. Job scolded his wife for her foolish talk and then continued in his sinless walk. Okay, there's your bonus. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Wait! We have another bonus! Ah! What a lucky day. Ah, uh, no, what a blessed day. Okay, we're going to jump ahead to Job 42 and the last few verses of that because there is something there very, very cool that you need to know. So Job 42, 12, it says, Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen Hapuk. Notice, at the beginning of the story, he had seven sons and three daughters. Now, he's had another seven sons and another three daughters, so his total children become 20. If somebody asks, Job, how many children do you have? Uh, 20. Ten are dead, but he still had 20. His sheep went from four, seven to 14,000, camels from three to six, ox from 1,000 to 2,000, and donkeys from 500 to 1,000. You notice something about these numbers. His then and his now numbers, the now numbers are doubled. And it reminds me of Exodus 22:7. And it says, if a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. You know, all of these possessions that Job had, they were put into Satan's hand to keep. And Satan stole them all. He took them all. And the thief was found out. And... He paid back double. Is that cool or what? And you know another cool thing is, I'm glad, by the way, you sat through that poem and you diehards stayed till this part. Do you notice that when Satan started taking things away from Job, he started by taking away the animals. He did not start with the kids. Why? Because it said every morning Job would wake up and he would sacrifice 10 animals for his 10 kids in case they accidentally sinned and, uh, in their heart, okay, or blasphemed God in their heart. So these 10 kids they were protected by the blood of these sacrifices that Job was doing. Satan couldn't touch the kids until he took away the animals. When Job no longer had animals to sacrifice for his kids, now his kids were open season. That's something we miss in the reading, but that's a huge parallel picture, right, that the blood protects us. Very nice. Uh, let's go on in Job 42, 15. It said, In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. You know, I told you at the beginning that Job was 210 
And we put him in that same category there with Abraham and Isaac in the same age range. How do we know he was 210? Nowhere in the text does it say that. <clears throat> but we know he was given double of everything, right? He was given 10 more kids. He was given double of all his animals. And it says, so after all of this boils and punishment or not punishment, these trials that Job went through, it says in 16 uh, verse, after this Job lived 140 years. So if he lived 140 years and he got double of everything, maybe he got double years. So I believe he had lived 70 years. That's where he suffered all of these trials and tribulations. And then at the end, when the thief was found out, he was given double children, double animals, and double years. He was given 140 more years. That tells me he had 70 to begin with, and now he's given double more, 140, which comes to 210. That's how we got that number. So the thief was found out. He had to pay back double. How cool is that? Thanks for watching. There's your second bonus. Better than the first. God bless. Bye bye. These pretzels are making me thirsty.